Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Catherine Metters, and I'm pleased to be hosting our latest webinar today on workplaces and ESG. What do they mean for your business and for your employee well-being? Before we get started today, a little bit of housekeeping, just to remind you that today's session will be being recorded and you will be sent a copy of that recording and other documentation um, after the webinar. So if you have any technical problems, be assured that you'll be able to listen back to that and also share it with your colleagues. We are going to be have time, or I hope we'll have time to do Q&A at the end of the session. So please, if you've got any questions, can you put them in the Q&A box rather than the chat? It just makes my life a little bit easier. Um, I'll know where to find your questions. There is a poll running. I hope you can see it on your screen. Um, it'd be really useful for you to answer that. Uh, just to let you know that the zero is the, you know, where you feel it is least significant um, impact and the 10 will be the most significant impact. So um, if you could answer that poll, that'd be really useful. And John and I will come back to that. Our speaker today is John O'Brien and he's from LCMB. He, in fact, he's the founder of LCMB Building Performance Limited. He has a master's degree in business, a degree in engineering, and he's a fellow of the RSA and the Leeds Sustainability Institute, so exceedingly well placed to discuss this topic. And Posturite is delighted to be partnering with LCMB with the Thrive offering, which we'll be outlining. Tom, could I have the next slide, please? For those of you that are new to Posturite, I thought I'd just spend a few moments um, with some photographs just to explain who we are. On top left, you'll see our MD, Chris Jones, and the other pictures are of some of my colleagues who are at various events. Um, and also the top right shows us with um, following a, a charity um, event um, as we're supporting the Stroke Association this year with our charity. As you can see, we're a pretty friendly bunch um, and really quite approachable. So please, if you have any questions about this topic or about any ergonomics pro projects, please reach out to us um, and we'll be happy to help you. So that's really enough of me and housekeeping. I'd like to move now and introduce uh, John. John, would you like to take it away, please? Thank you, Catherine. Uh, and good morning, everybody. As Catherine said, my name is John O'Brien, and I'm the founder and MD of the LCMB Building Performance Limited. We're delighted to be here today and partnering with Posturite. At LCMB, we've made it our mission to make workplaces perform as well as they can from an employee well-being, performance, and environmental perspective. We're delighted to be partnering with Posturite, who are an amazing ergonomic business, and our skills in optimizing indoor environmental quality for human performance and well-being really complements their offering. So our objective today is to explain the impact your workplaces can have on your employee well-being and how they can deliver and help uh, improve your ESG performance. Next slide, please, Tom. So I founded LCMB in 2009 with the mission to help our clients uh, create high-performing, sustainable workplaces for the people and customers. Our team combined the skills and experience in facilities management, project management, net zero carbon, and workplace performance to make every workplace as good as it can be. Now, over the last decade, we've helped our clients optimize their workplaces, employee experience and well-being, saving tens of millions in energy costs and reducing their carbon emissions by hundreds of thousands of tons of CO2. So our clients include public and private sector organizations such as the University of Oxford, King's College London, NHS Foundation Trusts such as Royal Berkshire and Royal Zurich, legal practices such as Wedlake Bell, music and media companies such as Havas and Universal Music Group, and transport companies such as National Express, we also work with a, a range of char charities, including the Royal Academy of Arts and Stewardship. Next slide, please, Tom. So ESG stands for Environmental, Social and Corporate Governance. And businesses and organizations are coming under more and more pressure from their staff, customers and stakeholders to demonstrate their ESG performance. So ESG essentially incorporates criteria uh, into the investment and management decisions 
in an attempt to promote environmental and social outcomes, sustainable outcomes. So ESG is a set of criteria and covers environmental, which looks at how a company's operations impact the natural environment. And it covers areas such as carbon emissions, resource consumption, waste management, pollution, climate change, mitigation, and conservation policies. And from a social perspective, we're looking at the impact that the business has on society. So it covers such factors as labor practices, employee well-being and welfare, diversity and inclusion, customer satisfaction and product safety. And from a governance perspective, we're looking at the way a company is managed and controlled. So ESG criteria are increasingly used by investors, financial institutions, and other stakeholders to assess the sustainability and ethical performance of your companies. Companies that prioritize ESG considerations are often seen as more progressive, responsible, resilient, and better equipped to manage risks and create long-term value. Overall, managing ESG is becoming more and more important for businesses to help make a real difference in attracting more customers, retrain, retaining staff, and out-competing your competition. Next slide, please, Tom. So, Tom, would we be able to... Ah, so, these are the results of the polls. And I'm delighted to see that um, the audience today already believe that um, the workplace makes a significant impact on well-being and ESG performance within organizations. We're clearly skewed towards this sort of top quartile in terms of the, um, the impact that it makes. I think this is absolutely right because the evidence suggests that your workplaces are definitely impacting ESG performance. We spend over 90% of our working life indoors and there's a whole host of research that shows the quality of our indoor environmental conditions in terms of variables such as CO2, temperature, relative humidity, noise, and light impacts our cognitive function by up to 25%. That's a quarter. For example, our research with Innovate UK, British Council for Offices, and Oxford Brookes University published in the BCA report, The Productive Office, uh, demonstrated that worker performance on tasks was up to 15% worse in poorly ventilated environments. So poorly managed workplaces will impact and reduce worker performance, their productivity, and the flip side, their well-being. Our buildings typically emit 33% of the carbon emissions from our whole organization. Um, and this is because of the resource use um, and energy used in running them. Therefore, they have a very, very significant impact on the um, environmental uh, performance of our organizations. All UK businesses are coming under pressure to improve their energy performance and decarbonize. And the government in the UK is committed to a legally binding 2050 net zero carbon date and is progressively imposing policy, legislation, taxation, pressure on all sectors to decarbonize. So decarbonizing your workplace will be required to deliver on the UK government commitments and your ESG commitments over time. Equally, there's a massive opportunity to improve workplace performance and resource use. The research shows that workplace performance, task performance can be increased by 15 to 30%, operating costs and energy by 10 to 20%, and overall annual productivity improvement for an organization increased by up to 5% of total staff time uh, by better managing the performance and environmental conditions of our workplaces. Next slide, please, Tom. However, the problem we have is that most organizations do not understand how their office environment is performing. This is because we typically don't have the information at our fingertips to see if the workplace is enhancing or reducing our staff well-being, performance, and productivity. Poorly controlled offices also cost a lot more to operate, use more energy, and emit more carbon than they need to. They will also make you less competitive than the competition who are focusing on the workplace performance. And they help 
retain staff in competitive uh, employee markets when optimized. A poorly designed or maintained office environment can contribute to various physical health problems. Factors such as inadequate lighting, uncomfortable seating, poor air quality, excessive noise, and improper ergonomics can lead to issues such as eye strain, headaches, allergies, respiratory problems, and fatigue. And these health issues can reduce well-being, productivity, and increase absenteeism. So indoor environmental quality refers to the physical and environmental conditions inside a building and covers air conditions, air quality, temperature, lighting, acoustics, and overall comfort. The indoor environmental quality can have a significant impact on staff. For example, air quality itself, so poor air quality, which would be characterized by pollutants, allergens, inadequate ventilation, can have a detrimental impact on staff, causing allergies, headaches, fatigue, difficulty concentrating, and respiratory issues. On the other hand, good air quality with proper ventilation, filtration, and control of pollutants promotes better health, alertness, and cognitive function. Lighting equally, if poorly maintained, with poor visual comfort can impact our employees in similar ways. So improving indoor environmental quality not only enhances comfort, health, and well-being, but it also has an impact, a positive impact, on staff productivity, engagement, and satisfaction. So this will contribute to a more positive and productive work experience for staff, supporting staff retention and acquisition and helping you outpace and outcompete the competition. Next slide, please, Tom. So what was really pleasing in the poll was to see that everybody agrees that our workplace can have a significant impact on the well-being of our staff and our ESG performance. The challenge is typically how can we do this in a cost effective and, and practical and pragmatic way? The LCMB and Posturide Partnership sets out to resolve this problem. Our Tribe Workplace Evaluation will give you the information, insights, and tools to optimize and maximize your workplace performance in terms of your staff well-being and, and environmental performance. So our workplace evaluation takes place in three steps, typically over a period of three months. Step one, using our wireless sensor technology, we monitor indoor environmental quality, capturing the workplace data in real time to our platform. We review the workplace and capture the available building information, such as occupancy, building management system data, et cetera, and conduct an employee survey. A second step is to evaluate this quantitative and qualitative workplace data and, ide and identify where there are gaps to the ideal for staff, well-being, environmental performance, and minimizing operating costs. The third step is to set out no cost, low cost, and invest to save performance investment opportunities, improvement opportunities for the workplace based on our client's specific circumstances and investment criteria. These identify what can be done to improve employee well-being and performance and reducing resource use. And the recommendations can be implemented by our clients or project managed and delivered by LCMB and Posturite on your behalf if required. Next slide, please, Tom. So our Tribe Workplace Evaluation has typically identified immediate annual returns for our clients in terms of performance improvement and savings of an average of three times the fees invested. And LCMB and Posturite are offering attendees of today's webinar, those watching the recording on catch up, a 20% discount on our Thrive evaluation for those who meet us by the 29th of um, September and subsequently instruct a workplace evaluation by the end of October. So if you'd like to book a meeting to discuss an evaluation, you can contact your um, key account manager at Posturite or reach out to us at sales at posturite.co.uk. And thank you. I'm going to hand back to Catherine. 
Oh, John, that was a lot of information in a fairly short space of time, um, which I think is, is excellent. But I just wonder, um, could we just go back a little bit um, and have a little bit more at some of those details? I mean, Tom, could you pop the um, was it slide six up? That would be great, actually, if you could do that. Um, because what I'd like to know, uh, John, is a little bit more about the, well, I'm going to look at, ask about all the stages, but a little bit more about the sort of measuring. You know, how intrusive is it? Um, you know, can you give us some, you know, some examples of, of things you do and how employees might 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 see them and, and the sort of data that you get back from them? I think I'd be really um, interested in that. Yeah, um, so the um, wireless sensor is similar in look to a fire alarm um, head. So it's it's about four inches. It's white. It's very um, unobtrusive. Uh, it attaches to um, a wall or a ceiling. Uh, it's it's in plain sight, but um, um, it's generally um, not not visually distracting for um, for people within the workplace. It can be installed in a matter of minutes. It's um, it is uh, battery operated. It communicates wirelessly to our platform, and in real time, it's it's collecting a range of indoor environmental quality data, which includes relative humidity, um, temperature, CO two. VOCs, ozone, and so on. So it's collecting um, a significantly um, broader uh, and a more detailed range of information than would ordinarily be available. Uh, in addition, we collect through um, our APIs, um, so we can electronically connect to any existing building systems like occupancy, building management systems, um, room booking systems, etc. And we collect that data. Um, the employee survey is, is is delivered digitally, so that's done through a, a portal or an email system. So the whole process is pretty unobtrusive um, and doesn't cause any any disruption to normal workplace um, or doesn't get in the way of, of what our clients are trying to achieve. Do, do you find it's well received? Do, are people interested in it? You know, when you go in and you're installing, do you get lots of questions and, and are people really engaged with this process now, do you think? Well, what, what, what we found um, is that certainly as a, as a consequence of COVID, people are a lot more interested in the quality of their environments. Um, and when the health and safety executive um, mandated um, uh, more granular review of CO2 in, in buildings, employees, um, have become a lot more interested in the, the quality of their work environments. Um, wearable tech is available to a lot of employees now. So in some instances, employees have a lot more data available to them than the people who are operating the buildings. So what we found is that in instances where our clients are investing in this work and presenting the, um, the results back to their employees, it's been very well received. Um, it, it, people see it as an as an investment in in them as employees and 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 their well being, and they're genuinely interested in in the quality of the environment that they're working in. And we're certainly seeing that younger members of staff have a, a lot more awareness around the sort of environmental and, and the quality of workplace environments, and more interested uh, in joining business who are demonstrating. Um, an alignment with and an investment in their sort of well-being and future okay i mean that, that that's good to, i mean i i'm not surprised but it's good to hear that that's reinforced and you know as far as the evaluation because obviously it's bringing together all the all the data that that you have um uh you're when you're evaluating do you talk to your client you're explaining what you're doing what 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 like you have in this this webinar very much well why are you collecting this data is it is it that evaluation is, is all part of that, is it? Yeah, so what, what we do is we collect the data set. So we've got qualitative data back from the employees in terms of um, their sort of user experience, the things that are getting under their skin, stuff that they'd like to see changed. And then we've got the what I describe as the quantitative data, which is the sort of data that we're pulling from the building around its real performance. And with the real performance data, we're able to set that against what we know are the best optimum and um, uh, poor environments and identify where a, a workplace perhaps isn't performing as it should to allow employees to perform at their best. And we uh, present that um, qualitative and quantitative data to our clients and explain it to them, identify what things would make sense from their specific circumstances and the constraints of their building 
and their investment constraints um, to improve the building. And then we, we build um, return on investment models that are specific to their criteria. Okay. I mean, do you find that when you're presenting the data, there's little light bulb moments? It's sort of like, oh, we wondered, or we have had lots of complaints, or that that data supports what we're seeing. Do do you find that with your clients? Yeah, we 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 find we find two things really. To be honest, Catherine, we find that um, there are certain things um, that come out of the data that explain why staff are complaining about maybe environments being too stuffy or uncomfortable or too smelly or whatever it might be, but equally. We, 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 we find um, hidden issues in every building we've looked at because of the level of detail that we're looking at um, the building. We, we've been able to identify um, hidden issues. It's almost like an MOT for a workplace. Where we're able to identify things which are out to tolerance, which can be easily fixed because over time, lots of buildings, when they've been com commissioned maybe many years ago, they move out of tolerance in terms of where they should be performing things get moved or changed and never moved back um, so things can be out of alignment for years and in some instances we found things um, not operating as they should which can easily be put right uh, but without going to this level of detail there's invariably in every building we've looked at there's some hidden problems as well as the obvious ones I was going to say, because most of the time we don't collect that that sort of data, we collect some data, we may know temperature and that sort of thing, but we we don't have that level of detail, do we? Yeah, exactly. I... Exactly right. Because in, in, in modern buildings, um, very rarely do we get data beyond temperature and relative humidity. Um, so the other um, variables and criteria within the space which which are making which have a huge impact on, on us as individuals, our well-being and our performance and our productivity aren't regularly tracked or are captured. Yeah. Do you know, I mean, it resonates. I've done assessments in the past and gone to see people and they've said, oh, it's the lighting that's the problem and can you come and look at this? And you walk in and you walk into a, a sort of wall of stuffy air, lighting's not bad and you're going, it's not your lighting. It's your well, air quality. I mean, that takes me back to several um, assessments I've done over the years, and um, but there's no way of measuring it, so people don't know. So what happens is people people get used to the environment they're in and they put up with it, and um, they shouldn't necessarily be doing that because the, the the environment they're in isn't allowing them to do their best work. Yeah. Yeah. And um, on the solutions, I, I think you, you you talked very much that there is a variety of, of solutions. Do you, I um, mean, not everyone's going to be able to do everything all at once. Do you work with people to provide a sort of timeline or you know, I presume it's just working with the client as what they say to you? Yeah, exactly. So when, when we um, do the evaluation, we'll identify um, the uh, easy to implement um, actions, which might be just re re resetting or recalibrating some um, bandwidths or uh, set points on the BMS system, which could easily be done. Um, so we identify the easy to implement um, actions that can be done by the client or their um, maintenance team or their provider. Um, we identify high impact actions, which may be a little bit more difficult to implement, and we would set out um, a, um, a program or an approach which would identify exactly how that could be done in time and cost if there was an investment required. So we concentrate initially on the easy low cost wins and then we work our way through to the um, the high impact uh, perhaps higher investment wins. Okay so very much a hand-holding exercise for many clients by the sounds uh, of it. Absolutely yeah. I mean some some clients are very sophisticated and obviously have um, uh, in-house uh, project management teams or property mm. teams and um, in those instances it's it's light hand holding some clients don't have that level of resource available and we can support them on a project management turnkey basis or whatever is applicable and suitable for the client okay i, I think that certainly um has answered a lot of my questions on on the detail um we will obviously have some chances of questions so if anyone wants to sort of any put some specific questions i've got a couple uh coming up at the moment um so i think probably the best thing to do actually is to join me to sort of put some of these to you um i think you've answered this one but we will just go back to it um we've got a, a question saying that they've got sensors in their building already However, they don't have any interface to analyze the work. 
are you able to work with any existing systems? Uh, yes, uh, as long as it's got a um, an API, um, which is just like an open connection comms, we can do that. If it hasn't got one, we can build one to suit. So because we've got a, a, a cloud hosted platform, uh, we can connect to any system anywhere globally. Can I ask a very basic question, yep. being a bit of a technical? What does API stand for? So it's API is just a interface protocol. So it's a okay. automatic way of um, interfacing from one um, control system to another. So okay. it's, it's a bit like, um, um, I'm trying to think of a computer example. Um, it's a it's a bit like middle software that allows two different systems to talk to each other. So you're exporting data from one system to another. OK, but that would obviously come out in discussions with a client. If they say we've already got this, then you could find out whether you could use that data, couldn't you? Yeah, if it's if it's a, if it's a modern system, um, it will be uh, will be capable of connecting to it in some way. Oh, excellent. OK, then. Um, and I've got another question. Uh, uh, the tenants of a building of nine floors. Do you provide evaluations on just one floor or would it have to be for the whole building? Um, so we can do either. So we've worked with um, with clients. So the example I gave um, are, are some of the examples I gave at the beginning were clients who are in multi-tenanted buildings. So we have a client who um, has taken occupancy of two floors in a ten-story building, has a um, has a landlord, and we worked with that client to optimize both the fit-out piece and to to work with their landlord to deliver it. So we can do either a whole building or a, um, a multi-tenanted or one section of a building. Okay, I mean, that, that, that's excellent, thank you. Um, oh, we've just said, just had uh, Kevin come and tell us that API is Applications Programming Interface. Well, I'm glad oh, I don't have to spell you. that. So thank, thank you, you Kevin, Kevin, for that. <laughs> Very helpful. A um, couple of other questions that we, we, we've had in advance. Um, Somebody's talking very much about. You know, are we always talking about the the cost effectiveness of doing ESG, or actually should we be looking more at well being productivity? Have you got any sort of um, advice for people when they're with their their colleagues trying to encourage um, focus on this? You know, apart from just it's going to save us money on heating. Um, what other things should we be discussing? Do you think? So I think, um, as, as I said out in the presentation, I think there's a big opportunity to improve the um, the employee experience, productivity, and well-being. In addition, if your buildings are used for customer purposes in in retail, or you're bringing your customers into the building, in terms of improving their sort of uh, experience, customer experience, user experience, and well-being, there's a big opportunity to do that. Um, there's clearly uh, a, a competitive angle because competition certainly in service businesses are um, competing uh, aggressively for talent for knowledge workers who are highly mobile um, so retaining attracting uh, employees um, demonstrating that you're investing in their sort of well-being and um, and longevity uh, is is um, is a big plus and on the environmental side, um, there's there's no doubt if um, you don't pay attention in the medium to longer term, uh, the environmental impact of your workplace as an organisation, it, it's going to become significantly more expensive and more difficult um, to manage. Government are putting in place tightening legislation over time. Policy is requiring us to look at decarbonising our workplaces. So by way of example, moving from gas heating to electric heating over time, which becomes progressively more expensive um, if it isn't um, managed uh, in the uh, in the short term. So I, I, I think the the approach with ESG, I think, is to think about how we can make practical, real differences for your organization in the competitive space. What are you what's your competition doing? What do you need to do to outpace them in terms of staff performance, retention and well-being? Uh, in terms of environmental performance and in terms of your car space. So I think ESG is a framework that, that does help in that regard, um, but it does need to sort of be aligned to, I guess, measurable and um, real differences and improvements that can be demonstrated to your colleagues. 
Mm. I mean, I'm, I'm amazed how much overlap there is with, with ergonomics, obviously my passion, you know, putting the, the person at the center, making sure that they are functioning to the best they can as, as a human. And, you know, giving you say, giving the oxygen, the lighting and that type of thing. I just think it, it, it just the overlap is huge. Um, got another question. Do you advise your clients on how they can use their building, e.g. the layout of building rooms, quiet spaces, collaboration spaces, etc.? Yeah. Is there ever that sort of side of it? Yeah. So, so when when we um, when we get involved in in feedback, if if a client wants support in that regard, or it comes up as uh, as feedback from the staff, we we can support um, the development of solutions in 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 those areas. Uh, typically, we would uh, go to um, architectural partners who we work with uh, in terms of interior design or or solutions. But we have project managed and delivered. Uh, interior upgrades and um, reconfiguration spaces to support our clients' needs or resolve problems which have come out. Yeah, I mean, I've certainly noticed a lot of people rejigging spaces and uh, and, and looking for some some help and guidance on that. Um, an another question here: Are there continued benefits, advice, or help in implementing the recommendations? following the report is there any follow-up at a later date do you do you keep in touch with your clients do you do find you revisit with them and and continually help them improve so, so so we we do have a platform available that can be connected to our clients buildings that allows them to manage the building in the longer term so once we've done the evaluation and the building has been optimized to bring it to its best performing position. We have a platform that clients can connect to that gives them reports in real time and allows them to optimize the building. That can be supported with reporting or with um, uh, hand holding or um, consultancy as, as, as required. So there is an opportunity to post implementation and post evaluation to support our clients to optimize the buildings in, in real time going forward. Do you, do you find that um, some of your clients or do you introduce clients to each other? Do you ever find some have, have similar similar problems and um, useful for them to, to communicate or is it not really that sort of community sometimes? Um, it, it depends. We find clients tend to communicate more across similar sectors um so because they've got similar issues to, to to resolve um we do see generic issues across um across sectors though depending on building type so typically buildings tend to be poorly ventilated or under ventilated um there's poor relative humidity control so we see consistent problems in the workplace environment but in terms of um, learning from each other we've seen more appetite for clients within specific sectors mm, okay actually that's very interesting what you were saying about some ventilation they've got to have a question about businesses with an older estate i mean i certainly got clients who've got older estate buildings beautiful but 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 a problem how can these be persuaded to embrace the new ideas and wouldn't sometimes the cost be seen as prohibitive? You must have come across clients with older estate and can you give us some insight into that? Please? Yeah, so we've worked with clients who've got grade one, um, grade two listed estates, um, historic estate. Um, we've also got clients who've got some problematic estates built in the sort of 60s and 70s where you've got um, sort of poorly built buildings with sort of poor insulation and, and, and function. Um, so I, I, I think... You know, the challenge is always to upgrade a poor performing building is going to cost money. Um, but to actually upgrade it to um, a high performing building doesn't necessarily cost any more money than it would cost to, re to, to refurb the building. So an approach that we've, we've, um, we've deployed for a number of clients is to baseline an existing building, older building, and then use that data to um, inform the refurbishment investment in the building from a well-being, um, employee experience, operating cost and energy point of view. So the methodology, um, our drive evaluation, sort of allows or lends itself to making um, you know, better investment decisions in the refurb of buildings because you're doing it based on um, evidence, which is a baseline of the building um a review of what the performance will look like post investment and what benefits you would get there's no doubt that um you know poor 
our older buildings are challenging because if you've got a grade one or a grade two listed building, there's difficulty with planning in terms of what you can do to that building to improve its form and function. Um, but in our experience, the extra over cost of actually going to a high performing building over an average performing building, if you're refurbing it, isn't that significant. Okay. Okay. I mean, that, that, that's useful to know. I mean, we have to be realistic about these things. You know, we've got these targets, we've got these things we need to do. It's important we all move forwards, isn't it? But we may need to move forwards in different stages according to what we've got. Yeah, but, but the, re the reality is, if we go back to the UK government's um, cl climate change commitment or net zero carbon commitment to 2050, every, every building, every workplace, every organisation is going to be have to be at net zero carbon by 2050. Many organisations have made much more significant um, commitments. So the university sector, NHS, private sector organisations have committed to a range of targets between 2030 and 2035. Uh, to actually get to a net zero carbon um, performance in a building, a, a level of investment is required. And I think it's really important to think about how you make that investment in a way that it doesn't deteriorate human experience, employee experience, well-being and productivity. Because if you make a super airtight building, which is poorly ventilated, it saves energy. But if what you're doing in the space um, isn't productive, it doesn't make any, any economic sense. Do you know what that makes a really Im important point that I, I suppose I hadn't really joined the dots on, but it is you, you're right. If you go down one route too much, you can miss out on something else. You know, so if you go down on the energy saving or the or the carbon route and you forget about your employees, you can make some big mistakes and big big losses. So I suppose this combined approach al allows you not to make those mistakes and to get the the best overall, doesn't it? Absolutely. So our approach um, says and, and is focused on delivering a workplace that allows people to perform at their best and then think about how do you use the minimum amount of energy, the minimum amount of um, operational costs, the minimum amount of carbon emissions to actually achieve that point. Yeah. There's no point in having a, a building or a workplace that isn't allowing people and organisations to, to perform at their peak. Yeah, no, that's a really important point. As I say, it's, it, it's looking at the thing as a whole, not the different parts separately. Um, I've got a, a specific question here. Um, is the advice you provide going to be better or similar to what a surety provide when they complete the six month environmental inspections? Now, it's not something I, I'm aware of. It, 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 do you understand what they're asking there? John. Um, so I, I need to look at the, the specifics of what the surety are, prov are providing mm -hmm. um, to, to be able to answer that. And I can answer it in the follow up. I suspect our, our, um, our review goes further in terms of well-being of staff and the environmental piece. But I can I would need to look at the specifics um, and we can answer that in the um, uh, in the follow up. Yeah. And also, I mean, I just want to go back back on the offer a little bit, you know, e in actually having a discussion with you about whether they want to move forwards, you know that that discussion is is, is certainly free, isn't it? Just to, to oh, discuss as to whether you need to do a um, if you want to instruct evaluation, but certainly reaching out and having a discussion is 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 not going to cost anybody anything, is it? No, absolutely right. So um, the the um, the workplace evaluation meeting would be an opportunity for us to review your specific circumstances or client specific circumstances and to develop a proposal and then it would be the client's choices to um yeah. the, the to decide to take that forward based on on the value that we demonstrate in the proposal so no so, so some of those specific questions could be answered in in, in that sort of discussion so absolutely and we'd yeah. be able to set out the um the return on investment in the proposal for the clients based on their specific circumstances Okay, uh, that's excellent. Now, I think we've answered most of our questions, which is great. I think I just want to check the chat because occasionally things go in there. Oh, yes, there's a, there's a question here. How do you interface with multi tenanted buildings where the occupier doesn't have control over some of these factors? 
Yeah, so what, so what we've done, so if you've got a multi-tenanted building um, and you've got an occupier who's on one floor, we can review the, uh, the performance on that floor. And normally the performance splits between the occupier and the landlord, and then we can facilitate the discussion with the landlord to support getting the landlord to improve the performance where it's not at its, um, at its peak. So we've done that with a range of um, uh, clients who've been uh, individual occupiers on one floor within a building, or they've occupied the whole floor, but um, they've got a, a a landlord. Okay, I mean that that's great, John. I think we've run out of time actually. Um, but you know, if everyone's got any questions, obviously they can reach out to you on the on on the link they've got. I just want to thank you so much, and um, you know, really useful information, really important for us. Um, we, we ran the poll again, as we can see, I think very much still the skew towards um, an educated um, audience, which is fantastic. And um, we just need our educated audience to talk to those people who are perhaps a little bit more slow to, to realizing how important getting people's environments correct for them and sorting out you know, the efficiencies and the environmental impact of our buildings is um, to us as a society, I think. Um, so thank you so much and I think I'm going to wrap this up now and I just want to say to everyone thank you for joining us today. Um, we are going to be taking a break over the summer and um, we'll be back with our next webinar in September but we'll obviously reach out to you and um, obviously a copy of this webinar will be on our website. So enjoy summer and I look forward to seeing you in the autumn. And thank Goodbye you now. everybody. Bye-bye.